So my name is Will Barnett, and my senior project, I wrote and published a novella. And before I start, I want to say thank you to you all for coming out tonight. My classmates and I have worked very hard on these projects over the course of this year, and it really is an honor to be able to present them in front of you all. So my first exposure to the senior projects happened in middle school. I think I was in about sixth or seventh grade, and we had Mr. Jansen as our class teacher. And we all went over to the big festival hall, and we sat down and we watched. And I don't remember any of the projects at all. I don't remember any of the kids who presented, and I don't remember what they presented on. At that time in middle school, I had middle schooler things on my mind. I was going through puberty. I was obsessed with my middle school crush at the time. And I was really looking forward to all the recess football games that were going to happen. So then I came to high school here. And I've been here for all four years so far. In early high school, I didn't give my project a lot of thought. It was just something that was put aside. The upperclassmen never really talked to us about it, and we were preoccupied with other high school things. So I think, for me, the reality that we were going to have to do a project really set in at the end of my 11th grade year. One of our old English teachers sort of prepped us and got our minds running on what we might want to do. And I had several initial ideas, and for various reasons, I dropped them eventually. And then summer came, and I was more into summer than thinking about a senior project. So before I continue, I want to tell you a love story. And I know you're probably thinking that this concerns another person, but unfortunately for me, nothing in that realm has worked out. <laughs> I've tried, believe me. <laughs> so at the age of 15, it was the summer, I think after freshman or sophomore year, and my family and I took a trip to the Solomon Islands. And this is a remote chain of islands off the coast of Papua New Guinea in the South Pacific. And we were diving there, and it was great. So you dive twice a day, and then you'd come back and eat. And the island was very remote, so there wasn't anything to do other than scuba dive. And so I had nothing to do. And my dad, per usual, brought a bunch of books. And so one day I was blankly staring into space, as you do, and he said, hey, why don't you try to read a book? And I had never liked books, and so I went into his room, and I sort of thumbed through the different titles, and I was intrigued by a cover of Graham Greene's The Quiet American. So I picked up this book, and I started reading, and I sort of fumbled through the first 20 pages. And then as the story picked up and the climax occurred, I just became drawn in and captivated. It was unlike anything I had ever read, and I just fell in love. So I finished that book quick, and then I promptly picked up a copy of John Steinbeck's The Pearl. And I'm sure you all have heard of John Steinbeck, the author. So through that, those first two books, I sort of stumbled into a love of literature. And that's stuck with me today. And <clears throat> this love of literature has really connected me more to my dad. My dad has always loved reading. And he'd, I'd always tease him. And when he wasn't um, playing with us or helping my mom around the house after work, he would be reading a book. And I, yeah, I always pestered him about it. And so today, still, we talk about books in the greater context of the world. And it's really connected us, which I love. And this, this love of books and literature has stuck with me until today. OK, so late last summer, I was looking for a job. And I love books, so I wanted to work with books. And my first two options were the Longmont Public Library or Boulder Bookstore. So a few days before I was planning on applying at the Boulder Bookstore, I went into this bookshop called Inkberry Books in Niwot. And I had been there twice. I had passed by. And it was always closed. And I really wanted to go. I love to explore new bookstores. And so this weekend, I was determined. And I looked it up. And I found out the hours. And I went. And it was very small and very charming. And I just browsed. And I struck up a great conversation with a co-owner whose name is Keith. And we started talking about literature, who we like to read. And it was great. So he gave me some recommendations. And I was feeling very confident as I came up to the counter. And I sort of asked him, hey, do you think maybe I could apply for a job here? And he said, OK, I think I can get you a job interview. And so the next day, I had a job interview. It was my first big, real job interview. And I was very nervous for it. Um, and it all went well. I met the owner, Gene, and I got the job. So I promptly started working there after that. And then I quickly found out that Gene owned a small publishing company called Owl Canyon Press. 
Okay, so now I want to talk about one of my favorite authors. So this was a couple weeks after I had started working at the bookstore, and I was in my room reading, which I love to do, and I was reading this book, as you can see here, which is called A Wild Sheep Chase by Haruki Murakami. And he's a Japanese author who I love. So I had just finished the chapter, and I was laying on my bed, staring at the ceiling. And I had just heard the story about how he came into writing. And so that story goes that in 1978, he was at a baseball game in Japan at Jingu Stadium. And the Yakult Swallows were playing the Hiroshima Carp. And Dave Hilton, who's this American player, comes up to bat, and he hits a double. And in the moment that the ball touched the bat, Haruki thought, hey, I could write a book. Pretty random. <laughs> so I was star sitting there, staring at the ceiling, and I thought, I sort of had a Murakami moment, if you will. I was like, hey, maybe I could write a book. I love to read, and now I have the means to do so with the publishing company. OK, so I've broken my actual project into four principal parts. And that is first, formalities, which will be brief, and then inspiration, both for the cover art and the actual writing itself, and then the process of both again, and then finally publication briefly. So formalities were relatively simple. The very first thing that I had to do was actually talk to my boss and see if this was even going to be a possibility. So we talked about possible page count, what the cover process would look like, and publishing, and then editing as well and what I wanted out of the project. So then we talked, we had a brief conversation, and we decided that it could work. So then I had to draft a formal proposal, which I did, and then reviewed with Ms. Bremner. And we talked over it, ch changed some things, and then ultimately decided that it was confirmed. So that's what I was going to do for my senior project. And then the very last formality was getting my mentor agreement signed by Gene, and we just wrote a quick synopsis of what it was that I wanted to do. So now I want to talk about inspiration. And first, I'm going to go over inspiration for the cover art. And this was something that was vital to me in the process. It was very important. So at this point, my room has sort of become a small library. I've amassed a pretty impressive collection of books. And Joan, part of the process was that I was going to design the cover art. And I didn't have any ideas. So I went into my room, and I just looked through some of my favorite covers. And I thought, OK, why do I like these covers? And why do they have an impact on me? And I know there's this old saying, all of you have heard, you can't judge a book by its cover. And I think that's mostly true. I think, obviously, that the content of the book and the writing rules supreme. But a great cover can enhance the power of a book. So these are the first two books I picked out four to show you today. And this is that very cover that I was talking about. This is by Penguin which is a publishing company I'm sure you've all heard of. And this is like a Graham Greene Centennial Edition, some sort of special edition. And I think this cover is very stylized and beautiful and very well captures the um, mood of this story. So then this book over here is Kafka on the Shore by the other author I was just talking about, Haruki Murakami. This is the first book I read by him, and I really fell in love with his writing after I read this book. And this is, I think, the Japanese or the first edition translation into English. And I think that this book really captures the mood of Murakami's writing and him as an author. And that is very intriguing, surreal, and also vivid. So I love that cover, and I love Murakami. And then here are two more. This is Wise Blood by Flannery O'Connor. And I think this is a great example of a very simple but effective cover. For me, it provokes a lot of curiosity. It makes me want to read this book. So. I think it also perfectly represents Flannery as uh, an author. Her, her work is very obscure, mysterious, but also intentional. And then this one here, I haven't read this book, and I don't actually have this book. I often like to go to New York Review Books website and just look at their new releases, and this was one of them. But I love their covers, and they're all the same style. And that is full art in the background, and then you have this square here with the title and the author. And they're Always very tasteful colors and tasteful art. And so, yeah, I love this one. And the flower really drew me in, the flowers, which you can see here. So this was my process. And it ended up looking like this. This is my actual book. And this took some time. Um, and for the lettering, 
I didn't have the tools to exactly print something on there with a printer. I didn't want to mess up the art. And I thought that my handwriting would look sort of inofficial. So I ended up going for a ransom style note. <laughs> um, it looks a lot better, I think, on the actual one. It's more blown up and it got condensed. I still like the way it turned out and I'm proud of that. Okay, so now I want to go over my process. So I think for me the hardest part of this entire thing was starting the book. I had this original idea in my mind that I wanted to write it about a World War II veteran who was trying to reintegrate into society after the war. And I actually started this book. I wrote an outline and then I wrote two paragraphs, maybe a page of this book. And I got writer's block after about two paragraphs, which is not a good thing. So I had to take some time and sit and reflect, and I realized that I couldn't relate to this experience enough, and this is my first book. So I dropped that idea. And then I sort of had this moment of panic. I didn't really know what to do, and a lot of my peers were actually starting their senior projects. So I wrote a series of vignettes, which you can see there in my book, and it was, they're just little stories, little ideas for stories. And some of them I expanded on, and some of them I didn't. And through those vignettes, a theme emerged, and that was the theme of solitude. And to me, this is something that's very important. I love to be alone, and I love to be with people as well, but having that alone time is extremely important. And most of the books I read portray that feeling in a bad light. And obviously, this is a story, so it needs a story arc. And so in the beginning, this main character has a negative connotation asso associated with that feeling, and then eventually, through the story, right, the climax, um, they come to have a different feeling about solitude. And so for the main character, I was sort of brainstorming, and I decided to go with a familiar character, and that was a teenage boy, because I am a teenage boy. And so then after that, after I had a main character, I had to develop him. And I didn't necessarily imagine him in my head and then just write down features of what he was wearing, what color his eyes, whatever. I wrote questions down, and then I tried to answer them. So I wrote sort of, why is he sad? Where does he live? What is different about him? Questions like that, and then I tried to answer them. And through that process, I developed a character. And then the final step before writing the book was obviously an outline of the book. And I had this big picture of what I wanted to do, and then I had to significantly narrow it down, and eventually it was organized into chapters. And even my final outline, I had to make edits. I had to cut things out. I added a chapter, and so, that was just something I dealt with in the process. Okay, so in terms of actually writing the book, that's the most important part, believe it or not. <laughs> and <laughs> so the first part of this is I would sit at my computer for hours, two to three hours, and I would just write. And I actually fell in love with this process. I think, like most of you probably, when you read a book, you imagine an image in your head. And a good writer does that very well. And so for me, it was cool to see the opposite of that. I would imagine an original image in my head and then try to put it into words. And I think I got progressively better at that as the book goes on. So after that, I would take a break for 20, 30 minutes, and then I would come back and do a basic edit. And so that was just sentence structure, basic grammar, stuff like that. And then I would save the real edits for my boss. And so we would go over character flaws, story flaws, stuff like that, flesh it out, and do a deep edit. Okay, so now I want to breeze over publication. Keep in mind if this was a book that was officially on the Owl Canyon's lineup, that it would have been more grueling, same with the editing, but it wasn't, so this was relatively simple. Um, so the first step was transporting the writing into a different format. So I wrote this book in Google Docs, and then Gene had a program on his computer and we transferred the text and then I had to go over it and just edit and make sure no mistakes occurred during that process. And then I got to pick a font. So every format, every platform has a regulation font and for this one it was called Garamond and I ended up choosing a font called Modern Gothic. So now I want to briefly run over what an ISBN number and an LCCN number are. So ISBN stands for International Standard Book Number. And basically what it is, is it's just a commercial identification number. It's required by all publishing companies. Um, you can see it right here. It's just the barcode. 
And a lot of them have it on the inside of the book as well. So in order to obtain one, you have to purchase it through an official, an official affiliate of an international ISBN agency. And in our case, that was a company called Bowker. So you have to just put in a bunch of information about the author, about the book, and then you have to pay. So one costs $125 and 100 costs $575. I was pretty shocked at how pricey they are. And then after that, you have to apply and obtain an LCCN number. And that stands for a Library of Congress Control Number. And you have to do this after you get an ISBN number. So the Library of Congress, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It's a real library in Washington, DC. It's a massive research library. And pretty much it houses every single book written in the LCCN era and many historical books and texts before it. And basically it's just a way to numerically catalog books. And it's free um, as long as your quote unquote best copy goes to the actual tangible library in DC. So my best copy is in Washington, DC at that library. So the final part of publication was inputting everything into a program called IngramSpark. And basically, basically what IngramSpark does is it's a distribution, printing, and dispensing company. And so they just ask you a bunch of questions, again, about author and book, and then questions on formatting. And then you get to do some fun stuff. You get to select your paper color, your binding type, your cover finish, dimensions, everything like that. And then you apply your text and your cover art, and you can send it off to be printed. And that usually takes about three weeks. But for me, I think it was one and a half to two. It was very speedy. OK, so now I want to read you the synopsis of my book and then a little excerpt from page 117. Okay. So I'm going to read the synopsis first. In a large and busy city, a young man named Arthur searches for self-love and contentment. In a vivid odyssey through bookstores, lost friendships, gardens, and music, Arthur uncovers old feelings and nostalgia. As this diverse city scenes unfold, Arthur experiences doubts and anxieties that eventually converge into a beautiful and ethereal realization about the nature of life and humanity. Okay, so like I said, this is from page 117. This is just a paragraph. After a while, my feet start to hurt. I look at my watch, 8.37. I sit on a bench on a main street facing the traffic. It is placed awkwardly on the corner, in an unassuming location. It is right underneath the entrance to a tall building. The metal is cool on my skin. The narrow one-way street is relatively quiet. An occasional car or person passes, disrupting the silence and motionlessness. I look at the high-rise building across the street. It is dull and uniform in its architecture. The classic city business building, nondescript and boring. There are several lights turned on in some of the windows. The light penetrates the curtains covering the windows of the offices. On one of the lower floors, though, the curtains are open. I observe a woman inside hard at work. Her sleeves are rolled up and she sits typing at her desk. She is slightly slouched from the fatigue of a long workday sitting in a chair. She does not notice me. Her long jet black hair is drawn back over her shoulders carelessly tossed out of the way. I can see paper strewn across her desk. She looks young, perhaps staying late to try and impress her bosses. A small gold watch rests on her left wrist. I can feel the seconds ticking away. Life is slowly being lost in the office. Seconds that could be spent in a garden, walking, laughing, exploring, learning, or something more, else more worthwhile. I suppose it's easy to have a negative outlook on office jobs when you're young. Once you have to rely on your own income, I suppose it must be different. Maybe one day that will be me. Right now, though, I have to live my life a little bit. OK, so now I want to talk about some of the challenges I experienced and then some of the aha moments. So I think the biggest challenge for me was actually starting this book. And when, once I got over that initial hump of trying to figure out what I was going to write about, the writing itself was pretty smooth. I'm, I'm really glad I stayed patient in this process, and I think at times I definitely questioned if it was worth it. A lot of my friends were doing more fun things that sounded desirable, and I was sitting writing, which in the end for me was worth it. This is the ultimate dream, so steps towards that. I think another huge thing was trying to maintain balance in my life. I had a lot of things going on at once. 
Um, I was in school, obviously. I was applying to college. I was working at the bookstore. I had my senior project to work on. And then I wanted some free time and somewhat of a social life as well. I think, like a lot of my classmates, I definitely felt defeated at times. And I'm glad I could push through it. And I'm very happy of my end result. I think the biggest takeaway for me is that I can accomplish my dreams if I work hard enough. And my dreams, obviously, is becoming a novelist. I think maybe I have a little bit of talent. And with some hard work, I think I could get there. So to close, I want to say thank you to some people. Gene Hayworth, number one, who's my mentor and the co-owner of Owl Canyon Publishing. He's here tonight. Could you stand and we get? Yeah, so Gene has done so much for me, not only this, but he wrote a beautiful recommendation letter for me for college and got me a job, and then this too. So I'm very appreciative of him. Joan Bremner, number two, she believed in my vision and was there to guide me the whole, the whole way through. And then my fr family and friends, they were always there when I needed to talk and sort of work through things. So I really appreciate all of you guys. Dr. Also, Dr. Miller's daughter, after probably three months of knowing me, we had a main lesson block, and she let me miss it so I could type because I was not on schedule to finish the book in time. Uh, Wynton Marcellus, if you haven't heard his music, I would go listen to it. When I would edit or when I would write, I started listening to his music, and it really helped me. I love him. And then lastly, my grandpa, who's not able to be here, um, Marion. We called him Big Daddy, all of us in the family. And whenever I would experience doubts or I had doubts about publishing this book and putting my hard work out there, I would always think of him. And so I dedicated the book to him, which you can see. I don't know if you'll be able to read it, but right in there. So. Lastly, I want to say thank you to you all for coming out and supporting us. And if you have any questions, I can answer them at this time. <laughs> There's two of you in a row. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, well I'm, I, I got to say, I, I, I read every word of your book. And uh, tremendously impressed uh, by the dexterity that you put into it, the uh, use of voice, your, your, your expressions, how you, uh, how you maneuver. It's really a, a beautiful piece of work and inspiring. Um, the question, you being a teenage boy, and um, what, what, what inspired the, the storyline? Uh, and was there anything autobiographical in this, or is there a particular figure that you, you follow? Yeah, so I def think it's definitely partially autobiographical. There's a lot of aspects of the character that I infused with myself. And um, so I talk a lot about literature in there and music, which are two things that I really love, and a lot of my experiences and even negative things that I've experienced. So. Yeah, it's his own character, but there's a ton of myself infused into the main character. I think you learn a lot about you and <laughs> yeah. 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 So I also had the pleasure of reading it. And I would like you to explain a little bit about the voice that you use in this mm -hmm. book, the choice of voice characters and why they're effective or mm -hmm. I thought they were really beautiful. Thank you. So yeah, so most of the book is first person from the view of Arthur. And then there are three chapters that I call perspective. Perspe perspective one, perspective two, perspective three. And they're all three different people. And for me, I love when books and authors switch it up. And that's sort of Murakami does that too. They'll have a dual storyline. So there'll be one char character and then it'll switch to another. And I think it just gives the book a whole new dimension. And so that's something I really want to portray too. Um, yeah, great question. So you can buy it. I have a bunch of copies right there directly from me, and it's $16 about with tax. And then also you can go to Amazon and Barnes & Noble. If you look up my name and the book, A Sea Change and Will Barnett, it'll pop up on there. So you could buy it there too. Mm -hmm. At any point during this process, did you consider maybe a career path in publishing? Yeah, I, I think I have. I think I would have to talk more about it with um, Gene, who's my boss, and he works in publishing and has for a long time. But that's always been something I've been interested as well, and interested interested in as well. And I think, yeah, originally that's what I wanted to do, because you get to read books for a living. So. <laughs> Did you 
who needs more sleep from being <laughs> writer blocked or from being inspired? Hmm. That's a really good question. I think I didn't really get a whole lot of writer's block. I think it was a short story and I knew what I wanted to do and so I just, yeah, sort of powered through it. I think during the process I got a lot of other ideas and I was like, oh, that'd be a great novel or that'd be a great short story. And so I guess, yeah, just up thinking, insp inspiration, yeah. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I think this summer I plan to write a collection of short stories. And I don't know if I'm ready for my next big project yet, but short stories are appealing and I have a bunch of those that I would like to write. So. What's next for you in the fall? Um, I don't know yet. I think I'm going to take a gap year and I'm not quite sure. I'd love to write and go around and travel. Um, I've gotten into a few colleges, so I'm considering those and yeah, I'm just going with the flow right now, I think. <laughs>